Hello everyone, so if you've ever inflated a balloon you've probably noticed that it starts off fairly difficult to make it inflate but then once the balloon has grown past some certain size it actually becomes easier and easier to make it grow even more. So what we're going to do in this video is develop a simple mathematical model for a gas-filled balloon to understand both quantitatively and intuitively uh, the origin of this effect. So I've already written out a formal statement of the problem which is how much excess pressure is required to inflate a balloon to a radius of r. The idea being that the higher the pressure required the harder it is to inflate the balloon to that particular radius. And also note that I've called it excess pressure rather than just pressure because we're going to have to have a bigger pressure inside the balloon than in the surrounding air in order to counteract the tension forces in the balloon that are trying to make the balloon contract. So the excess pressure is the bit that we care about, which is how far above the atmospheric pressure does the pressure inside have to be. So we're going to assume that our balloon always keeps a spherical shape and under that assumption we can specify the excess pressure required in terms of just a few parameters of the balloon. So we've got what I've called the unstretched radius and the unstretched thickness. When I say unstretched you have to imagine that you've put in just barely enough air to make the balloon keep a spherical shape without actually uh, having the rubber material that it's made of stretch at all. Then we've also got the Young's modulus of the rubber material that the balloon is made of. If you've never come across that before I'll define it more quantitatively later on but it's basically a number that quantifies how an elastic material uh, stretches in response to an applied force. Now the first key equation we're going to need in this video is delta P is 2 gamma over R where gamma is the tension per unit length acting in the rubber skin of the balloon. R is of course the radius of the balloon and delta P is the excess pressure which is exactly what we're looking for. If you've seen this equation before that's great, if not you might want to have a look at my last video in which I actually derived that equation but I'm not going to go over the derivation again now because it's pretty involved if you want to do it properly. Now this equation is often used in the context of bubbles. For example, if you have a bubble of carbon dioxide in some water, you can calculate the pressure inside the bubble using that equation. Under those circumstances, gamma is a constant. It's the surface tension in the liquid. The complication when we're dealing with the balloon is that, of course, the tension force in the skin of the balloon is going to get bigger and bigger the more you stretch the balloon. And so gamma depends on R, and our main task in this video is to figure out how exactly gamma depends on R. So this would be a good moment to formally define the Young's modulus. The Young's modulus E um, is the stress in the material divided by the strain, where the stress is the force per unit cross-sectional area and the strain is the fractional increase in length. This is a useful thing to consider in this context because ultimately what it's doing is linking an applied force to the amount by which the object stretches and therefore if we do some algebraic manipulation, introduce some other parameters, we're going to be able to turn this definition of the Young's modulus into a relationship between gamma and R. So let's think about what we know about the stress and the strain and the first thing to do towards that goal is to consider a small element of the rubber material on the surface of the balloon. So I've drawn out a small element on the screen. Um, it's basically a volume element in spherical polar coordinates, um, but if it's infinitesimal, if it's very small, you can pretend it's a cuboid and calculate things like the areas of the various faces by pretending it's a cuboid. I've defined the width of that approximate cuboids to be W and I've said it has a thickness of T. T is different from T0 which I originally defined as the unstretched thickness because you can see that as the balloon inflates the skin is going to get thinner and thinner so that T um, on the diagram is a function of radius. So of course this particular volume element um, on the surface of the balloon is being stretched in all different directions by all of the surrounding little bits of rubber but if we want to figure out what the stress is on this particular element we can just focus on the force in any particular direction of our choice because by symmetry um, the stress is going to be isotropic it's the same in all directions. So let's choose to focus on the stress on that front face of our little element and so there's going to be a force acting perpendicular to that face. We defined gamma to be the tension force per unit length within the surface um, of the balloon skin and so we just take gamma multiply that by the length within the skin of the balloon which is w the width of the element so the force is gamma w so then we use the fact that um, stress is force per unit cross-sectional area um, we've just said the force is gamma w the cross-sectional area is of course just t times w and then w doesn't actually matter because it cancels out and you find that the stress is just gamma divided by t so we've got an expression for the stress how about the strain well the strain is defined as the fractional increase or the fractional change in length of the object being stretched. Now, we could apply this equation to our little volume element 
uh, it's possible, but there is an easier way to do this. So instead of our small volume element, we're actually going to consider a big ring shaped element, which is basically the cross section of the balloon along uh, one of its great circles. In other words, basically what I've drawn out in my very first diagram. The reason that makes things easier to deal with is that, well, the length of that element is just the circumference of a circle. And if it's got a radius of r, then the circumference is just 2 pi r. Um, originally, before it was stretched by definition of r naught, it had an unstretched length of 2 pi r naught. Then we're just going to divide that, of course, by 2 pi r naught. Then the 2 pi's cancel, and you find that the strain is just r minus r naught over r naught. So now we've got expressions for both the stress and the strain. Let's plug them back into our definition of the Young's modulus. So E is going to be equal to, well, we've got a sigma, which is gamma divided by T. Then we've got that divided by um, epsilon, the strain. So we're going to take r minus r naught over r naught and flip it because it's on the bottom of a fraction. So multiply by r naught over r minus r naught. Just clean that up a little bit. You get gamma r naught divided by T into r minus r naught. What we ultimately care about is gamma, the tension per unit length, so that we can plug it into our delta p equation. So just going to rearrange that equation to get gamma on its own. You find that gamma is et into r minus r naught divided by r naught. Now remember earlier we said that this t, the thickness of the balloon at an arbitrary radius, is a function of radius. It's not a constant. The original thickness is t naught. How can we figure out what t is as a function of radius? Well, we can make an assumption um, that the volume of the skin of the balloon is conserved. So of course the volume of the balloon itself is not conserved because we're putting more and more air into it, but we only have a certain amount of solid material to work with um, along the surface of the balloon. We can assume that the volume of rubber itself is not changing. Now if the thickness is small compared with the radius, which is definitely true for a typical balloon, then the volume of the actual rubber part of the balloon is the volume of a spherical shell. To get the volume of a spherical shell, you can do the surface area of the shell, so 4 pi r naught squared multiplied by the thickness of the shell, which is t naught initially. So that's the initial volume of the rubber. Then of course we just set that equal to the same thing without the zeros, so the uh, radius squared at some arbitrary time uh, multiplied by the thickness at some arbitrary time. Then we can just rearrange that to get t in terms of r, so t is going to be r naught squared t naught divided by r squared. Then we're just going to sub that t back into our expression for gamma and simplify. So let's see what happens. We're going to conclude that gamma is equal to e and then we get r naught squared t naught in place of that t. Still got our r minus r naught factor. On the bottom you have now an r squared from that t expression. You've still got your r naught. Then you can cancel down um, one of the r noughts and get e r naught t naught times r minus r naught divided by r squared. So now that we've got our expression for gamma, it's very straightforward to get an expression for the excess pressure delta p because delta p is just 2 gamma over r. So all that's going to happen is that we pick up an extra factor of 2 on the numerator. So we've got 2 e r naught t naught times r minus r naught. We've got one extra factor of r on the bottom, so it was r squared, so now it is r cubed. So there's our expression for the excess pressure that we were looking for. Now let's take a few moments to think about the implications of that expression. A good starting point would be to do a little sketch of delta p as a function of r, and to do that we're going to sketch two related but simpler graphs first. So I've just sketched out those two simpler graphs up here where the first one has the x-axis being r and the y-axis being r minus r naught and the second one again the x-axis is r the y-axis is now 1 over r cubed. Now why have I decided to sketch those two particular functions? Well you'll see that in our expression for delta p we have a bunch of constants so 2 e r naught t naught that's just constant so that doesn't really affect the shape of the graph in any fundamental way but then the remaining part of that delta p expression is r minus r naught multiplied by 1 over r cubed so if we know what the two individual graphs of those sort of sub functions look like we can uh, imagine what you get if you were to multiply those two shapes together. So of course that first graph, the graph of r minus r naught against r, is just a linear graph. It has a gradient of 1 and an x-intercept of r naught. That second one is just like a standard uh, reciprocal graph 1 over r cubed. And essentially what you can see is that as the radius increases from r naught upwards, this linear graph is going to make the pressure increase at first, but then when we get to very large radii, the 1 over r cubed term is going to dominate over the r minus r naught because, well, 3 is a higher power than 1, right? r minus r naught is a linear graph, while 1 over r cubed is a cubic graph. So for large values of r, 
the one over r cubed sort of wins. And so the net effect is that you initially go up, your pressure curve initially goes up due to the linear part, and then eventually it's going to go down again because of that reciprocal cubic part. If you put that all together, you conclude that the shape of the graph looks something like the one that's just appeared at the bottom there. And it has the feature that we described at the very beginning where the required pressure gets bigger and bigger as you inflate it from its unstretched radius, but only up until this point here, um, at which point the required pressure to inflate it further actually drops and it becomes easier to inflate from that point onwards. I haven't marked on um, the radius and pressure at that turning point. Of course, if you wanted to, you could differentiate the delta p expression, um, but I'm not going to bother to do that in this video. So now that we've worked through all the maths, let's just finish by taking a couple of moments to gain some intuition as to why the graph actually does behave this way. So essentially, you know, mathematically, you've got these two competing terms. You've got the r minus r naught, which is growing with r, and the one over r cubed, which is getting smaller as r increases. Now, what's the physical origin of each of those terms. Well, the r minus r naught term, if you remember, that came from the strain. So the idea there is that the more strain you put on the balloon, um, the more force you are going to tend to need to produce that strain, right? If you want to stretch something more, you need to apply more force. So it's already fairly intuitive to understand why the pressure gets bigger with radius at first. But then what about this r cubed on the denominator? Where did that come from? Well, it's come from two places. It's come firstly from the fact that there is already an r on the denominator of that original delta p expression that we had, but that's been combined with an r squared from our gamma expression that we derived. Now, which of those terms is more important for determining the behavior of this graph? Is it the r or the r squared? Well, I would say it's actually this r squared, in fact, definitely this r squared, because if you only had r on the denominator of delta p, um, you would conclude that the graph doesn't actually have a maximum at all. It would just keep getting bigger and bigger. Eventually, um, it, has a, uh, it would have a horizontal asymptote. So it's specifically because of that extra power of r squared in the gamma expression that the curve eventually um, sort of gets smaller and smaller. Now, if you think back to our working, the origin of the r squared on the denominator of gamma was from conservation of volume. Um, and it just reflects the fact that the thickness of the skin of the balloon is getting smaller and smaller the more we inflate it. Now, as we make the skin of the balloon smaller and smaller, we're reducing the cross-sectional area of any given element. And if it has a smaller cross-sectional area, then it's less able to provide a force. So just to summarize all that, essentially it increases to start with because you're putting a strain on the balloon and strains always require forces to produce, but then it decreases eventually when the balloon gets thin enough, the skin of the balloon gets thin enough and its cross-sectional area is no longer capable of providing uh, such a large force. Okay, so we've now explained the phenomenon that we set out to explain. So I think we can leave it there. Thanks for watching and see you soon.